landscape maintenance damage, we see a lot of that. And you've seen a lot of that. Uh, you'll see markers that are um, typically not up on a big base, they're the type that are actually um, directly buried into the ground, you know, like a regular tablet style marker. Um, those have the grass growing all the way up to it, and it's usually weed ear damage or mower damage. Um, back to Chalmette, believe it or not, the National Park Service spec when we were down there doing the restoration work was to use wire core weed eater string. <clears throat> Our weeds are really bad. That was their excuse. And that's what you heard from all the maintenance people. Our weeds are just so tough, you know, regular string won't cut it. Um, so they literally had a wire running through the middle of the core, and you'd wash them every day, weed eating out there, just going right across those stones. And every single one of those headstones out there on the outside corners, about that high off the ground, are rounded. They're not sharp. And it's from hitting them with, and it wasn't lower damage, it was all weed eater damage out there. And when that uh, storm came through, they all snapped right at the weed eater line. Uh, every single one. That was the weak point. So that's where they all broke. Uh, and and it, uh, they may have all broken anyways, uh, but it definitely didn't help the situation at all. <laughs> so, mowers as well. Uh, you know, we all have these big mowers now. You know, I've got this brand new Kubota 60 inch that I'm real proud of. You know. I'm not going to fool myself into thinking I can fit that through an area that's 60 inches wide, you know, or 62 inches wide without hitting something. You know, we're, we might be skilled, but we're not that skilled. You know, someday we're going to hit it. Um, and then use the lightest trimmer line possible. So if you are going to weed eat around monuments, anything like that, I mean, I know your big steel gas powered weed eater, you know, will run that, what, point. 090 line or whatever it is, you know, the real heavy line with the, the barbs on it and everything, but do you really have to have it? You know, just think about that. Can I use something a lot thinner and go through here and will it do the trick? <clears throat> now I understand spring, the first time, you have to be a little bit more aggressive with your cleanup and things like that. So it's just going to take more time with a thinner line or you're going to need to go around and do it by hand or do something a little different. But if you maintain if you truly are maintaining your cemetery, that little thin line will do just fine. I mean, just don't let it get overgrown is what it really comes down to. Uh, lack of tree limb maintenance. So um, take the time to really look at your trees. I mean, sometimes we think that one that's just growing up against the headstone or something is, is an issue. Well, what about that big dead limb 40 feet up in the air that's hanging way over that's just one windstorm from taking out six monuments? Uh, do the right thing with, with being proactive on those things. Don't wait until it's too late. Algae, fungi, and lichens. Um, what about biological growth? And a lot of us think, well, it's just ugly. You know, it's just, it, it's unsightly or whatever. It, it's more than that. It actually goes into the stone, like roots, deep into the stone. It can cause damage, believe it or not, while those roots are moving and growing on a very weak stone. Uh, but it also, some of those produce acids, which are going to deteriorate the stone as well. Uh, so you want to kill those, remove those. It's not, it's not just for looks. Landscaping chemicals. So, okay, well, we want weed eat. I'm going to round up the heck out of this place. If you look at the ingredients on all of those products out there, whether it be ortho, roundup, spectricide, uh, generic products, whatever it may be, Somewhere on that label, the active ingredient is a salt. <clears throat> and that should not be used around stone, period. It's no different than salt in your driveway. What does that do to it? It's breaking it apart. It just, it, it eats it away. Um, so that's an absolute no. Uh, to use Roundup, Spectricide, any of those products. Um, water repellents will create a film. Okay, sometimes we think, well, we're gonna save this stone, it's just getting too wet, and it's just deteriorating from all the moisture or whatever it may be. I'm gonna apply a water repellent to this. Not a consolidant, that's a whole different product, but a water repellent. I don't care if it's Thompson's Water Seal or ProSoco Siloxane WB or whatever it may be. Those products, when applied, are gonna penetrate that stone to a certain depth and stop. And they are going to create a film in there. 
And sometimes we say, well, a couple years later, once again, it needs another application. And do it again. You keep creating a film behind that stone right in there. And with our weathering cycles, it's, it's a barrier. It's a slight change, but it's a barrier. And it can then just blow the face of that stone out right at that location. <coughs> Water repellents have gotten better. They used to do this. I mean, it would, uh, there was a lot of damaged stone out there. Um, but I still don't trust them. Why, why do it? It is something that we've created to solve a problem that probably doesn't really exist if you just allow that stone to, to breathe or clean it so that it can breathe better, get the algae and stuff off it, you know. Do some other things first. It should always be a last resort. Um, <clears throat> in cleaning, um, we always hand clean. No pressure washers, okay? Um, use a soft bristle brush. I'm not talking about a, you know, a paintbrush type soft, but something that's not dramatically aggressive, you know? I'm not looking for something that's going to clean your grill, okay? Yeah. Uh, nothing like that. I mean, it needs to be something that is flexible uh, and acid resistant or cleaner resistant, designed for use with cleaners. Um, always start with the least aggressive product and work up. So if you have special conditions or circumstances that maybe the biological cleaner didn't take care of it, and now you talk with ProSoco about your, your problem, and they say, yeah, use this product, ask them, is that the next step up from what I'm doing now? Or are you taking me all the way to heavy duty restoration cleaner, okay? Uh, cancer in a can, you know? What, what are you taking me up to here? So ask them those questions to take the next step up. And then each of them, what you're going to find is they typically will say, start with a solution, this is on the product data sheet for these cleaning products, start with a solution of one part cleaner to 10 parts water. Absolutely do that. And they don't say that's for like moderate or light staining. You know, for, the, for moderate staining, let's go from that to one to five, see what that effect is. And then if that doesn't work, use it in concentrate. You know, use it 100% straight out of the bucket. Um, but what I'm saying is start the 1 to 10 and then work up. If you're happy with 1 to 10, stop right there. Yes? Will spray water <coughs> work on some of the Yes. Water? Yes. Yes. In uh, environmental clean, like if you have heavy algae or uh, heavy lichen or fungus or whatever, not necessarily. Now, we'll soften it up so that you can then maybe take a wooden scraper or a plastic scraper and scrape off some of the heaviest of what you see. Um, but those, you know, biological feeds on water. You know, so you're, you're kind of giving it part of what it wants in a way. But it'll soften it up and help you at least get the first layer off. Now, if you notice that, boy, this is just not really, you know, I've cleaned off the biological and it's, it's still dirty or something on here. It's probably carbon acid rain environment, carbon can be removed with water. But here's what you need to do is you mist it with water and you do it through time. So if you can set up like one of those little, you guys ever see those little snake misters like you can stand on your deck, they're really popular. I mean, Home Depot, I used that a few years ago. Just hook up a garden hose to it and just sit it there and just let it mist, let it mist. We've cleaned entire buildings that way. We've set up scaffolding and ran misters on all the scaffolding and just misted that building for days. And it was clean afterwards. But that's for carbon, carbon deposits. Yeah. yeah. I have a, a resource list here that I'll be handing out. It, it has some of that information, the websites, some of these companies that I've mentioned. Okay, so the question is, what type of water can we use? If you're in the country, you can use well water or city water. They all have something in it, right? What, you know? what do you recommend? <laughs> um, I, I would recommend the city water. And I would then also put an RV water filter on the end of that hose. Uh, is anyone familiar with those at all? So RVs, you know, big deal. That some of them have built-in systems, like your home, you know, in the side of the RV. Some of them, you just hook up to a, a hose, right, on the outside, and there's no filter, so you can put an inline filter. You buy them at Walmart, and I actually have that on the resource list. And it's just a water filter about that long. You can put it on your garden hose and it will take chlorine out of it. It'll take some of the metals out of it, sediment. Sometimes there could be a little piece of iron 
that comes up with it. And if you're mixing like repair materials, like patching materials and stuff, and you get a little piece of iron in it, now you've got this rust streak. I've seen it happen. So we use those. Okay. All right. Rubbings. Um, has anyone ever performed a rubbing on a stone? Yep. Several. They actually do make products that are designed for rubbings. Um, you know, special papers that you put on there, and a special type of ink, you know, like in a wide stick that's kind of flat and, and uh, that are fairly safe to use. Um, it should be done really more by people that are trained in conservation and preservation so that they're able to identify whether or not what I'm about to do is going to cause any damage. And, and when I say that, it, it's really this. Raised letter style stones where the letters are protruding, those are very fragile. And they, they can be really soft and depending on the age of the stone, they can break off really easily. So that's really what I'm talking about when I talk about the danger of rubbings. It's situations like that where I put paper over it, now I'm taking a, a pencil or a crayon or whatever and I'm rubbing over it and I'm knocking off letters or a raised element of some kind. And it does happen, it happens. Um, it's usually not by people like us that are kind of more interested in preservation. We will tend to identify those potential pitfalls earlier, but it's, it's just people that kind of do it as a hobby. Like, hey, I'm gonna run out to the cemetery and do some rubbings, it's interesting, you know. Um, so anyway, so yeah, assess the stone condition prior to the rubbings. Um, does anyone have policies in their cemeteries where we say no rubbings? There are some cemeteries that do, and that's up to you. If you do an assessment of your cemetery and the overall condition of your stones, and you see that potential damage can be done, feel free to put a sign out there. It's, it's your right to do that to protect those. It says no rubbings on this property, Photo photography only. Do what it takes to protect them. <clears throat> and that's where we talked earlier about the alternatives, you know, using the digital photography and mirrors for, to reflect light or flashlights to pick up some of that. Um, and, and actually, flashlights work really well at night to do this. In the daytime, you can kind of see the effect, but if you go out later in the day when the sun's setting and it's getting dark and you shine that flashlight on there, obviously you're getting more contrast because you don't have the natural light. So that's a really good time to do it as well. So digital camera and flashlight in the evening is great. And who doesn't like to be in a cemetery at night? <laughs> okay, some additional hazards. Uh, we talked about ferrous metals. Um, there were a lot of actually originally set stones that were set with ferrous metal pins. When I say ferrous metal, it's really anything that's going to rust, like an iron, steel uh, pin that's going to rust. And, uh, and they were used a lot in original installations. Um, we use stainless steel. Um, the stainless steel that we use for pinning is typically a threaded rod, and it's a grade called 316 grade. 316 grade stainless steel um, is rated for marine use. It has an additional alloy in it that other grades of stainless steel do not have that makes it very resistant to salts and moisture and things like that. Regular stainless steel is fine against just normal moisture, but not the salts. That's what that extra alloy does in 316 grade steel. If anyone's heard of a company called Fastenal, uh, Fastenal provides fasteners and all types of things to the construction industry. They're in every major city across the country. They'll even ship directly to you. They have every kind of stainless steel, threaded rod, and pin you can find. <clears throat> okay. Concrete pole bases. So we'll see some of those as well when we go to the cemetery. Uh, it's basically I've had a stone that's been broken or, you know, whatever it may be, the base is lost and I just found the top. I'm going to dig a little hole. I'm going to mix it. A slurry of concrete. I'm not mixing it thick. I'm going to add a lot of water to this and I'm just going to pour it down the hole and I'm going to take that headstone and I'm going to drop it in it and I'm going to kind of shake it and set it and maybe put a couple boards on it to hold it until it sets. Okay, that's a puddle base. Um, the more water you add to a concrete, um, the more uh, it can penetrate open pores, you know, because it's, it's thinner. So it'll really grab onto that stone and there's no removing it. <clears throat> so I would call that a non-reversible technique, okay? A better technique would be to pour a little concrete base at the grade, pour it with a couple pins in it, sticking up, 
maybe you've got a corner of that, a little corner of that bottom part of the stone that won't let you set it, you know, down even. Go ahead and make sure that one pin goes a little higher and it goes all the way up and gets into it. Now I can either use a piece of stone that I've cut to patch in that space, or I'm going to use a patching board, which we're going to talk about and, and we're going to work with it tomorrow. And I can actually pack that thing full of a patching board. Is it going to match the stone perfectly? No. It's going to fill that void. It's going to make it structurally sound. It's going to keep it up, okay? Not buried in the concrete. It's going to keep it up. And it's going to allow that stone to breathe. That patching board breathes really well. Um, that's a better option than the concrete. Uh, cementitious patching materials. That patching material I just talked about that we can infill that area with, um, that is breathable. Cement is not. So when I go to put that in there, I'm creating a barrier and I'm bonding to it and I can potentially cause other problems or just that patch is just going to fail. It's not going to bond completely because moisture can't move through the stone naturally. Yeah. All right, let's see. Other improper, let's see. Improper use of epoxy. There we go. We're on epoxy. <clears throat> so we've all seen epoxy repairs, I'm guessing. So you've seen stones with something running out of it. Crap. What, what is that? You know, two pieces put together and something kind of running out of it. It's either A, it's either A or B. Um, it's either A, liquid nails, um, which was used a lot, um, which is not a great adhesive for stone. It'll say it'll bond anything, and it will for a little while, but let it go through one season, I'll bet you can just go pop, and it just pops right off. Um, or epoxies uh, that have been placed in there uh, that are really runny, and they just kind of used out, and they left it on the face of the stone. So. Okay. Like a wick, when a stone is placed in the ground, it draws moisture up and it draws it down. It's just like a thermometer, you know, going up and down. Well, anytime that moisture comes up and it hits a spot and it can't go any further, it kind of sits there. And then it may recede, but it does it over and over again, over and over again. And what I mentioned earlier was in water, especially what comes out of the soil, is salt. So it's constantly hitting that and then receding. Well, the water might recede, but it's leaving deposited salts every time it does that, okay? So what you'll find is at that crack, it'll actually start eroding away from the repair through time, below it and away from it. Whereas if I use another material that is breathable as an adhesive, then I'm allowing that moisture to just do its thing. And if it goes up, it's all depending on temperature and humidity. How high it goes every day, sometimes way higher, sometimes lower, sometimes not at all, depending on how dry it is. So it's varied. That's fantastic. It can go anywhere it wants. But when it hits that spot every time, and it's just depositing it there every time, you're going to cause damage. That's what epoxies do. It creates a barrier. Great adhesive. Epoxies have their place, and we'll actually use epoxy out here. But I'm going to use it in a hole or two for a pin. Moisture is still going to go around it. I'm not going to block it in a whole layer across the stone. Okay, other hazards, just aggressive handling of the stones uh, during resetting. Once again, we talked about just making sure that we're not strapping a chain around it or anything like that. Your hands are really the best thing. Stick with them, good pair of gloves, strong back. Talk about a couple hazards here. This was kind of a creative idea for their little mower. They just took a pool noodle, wrapped around the edge of the deck uh, on that side, that was a good idea. There's a, a bit of a hazard there as well. <clears throat> Anyone tell me what that is? What are we seeing? That's from a water repellent. Yeah, so that's that, that's that layer that we built. Even old consolidants, old ones, the new ones aren't this way. They penetrate much deeper. They do a better job of filling the whole matrix of the stone. but old consolidants created a film like that. You could actually see it. Another example of us reinventing the wheel, you know, boy, there has to be something better. Yeah. Has to be something better. You know, I believe in the old techniques and just letting stone do its thing. If we remove our modern treatments and let it be what it is and just give it the environment that it needs, it will last a long time. I'm sure you can tell what this is. It's pressure washer damage those stones. 
And these are a few of the companies that I mentioned. I'm going to go ahead and hand this out. And I'm sure I've missed some items on this resource list, so just get with me. Okay, so one item on here is this Sikadur 32 Epoxy. That's made, it's a company called Sika. And you don't have to use that epoxy. It's just, it's, it's if you're buying something, you're gonna do a lot of it. It comes in two one gallon kits, and it's just a one-to-one -one mix. So it's easy to mix. So if you have a lot of pinning to do, it's, it's, a, it's a good setup to get. Um, we're going to be using something simpler. Uh, you can use, if you're, if you're just doing threaded rod work, which is what we're going to be doing, I'm using a, a product by Sika that you can just buy at Home Depot. And it's in their concrete department. It's, it's an anchoring epoxy, because that's what we're doing, is we're anchoring two pins. Um, so it's in a caulk tube. And it has a nozzle on it that blends the two components. So inside the caulk tube, there's a divider right down the middle. One side of it is the part A, one side is the part B. You have a nozzle that you put on the tip of it, and it blends it as you're squirting it out. So by the time it comes out of the end, the tube's mixed. You always waste the first couple inches, just make sure you've got it mixed. Um, but it's a very convenient product to be used, and that's what we're going to be using. But this is more if you have a lot of it, you want to buy it in bulk, you save some money going that way. I think it's just called Sika Anchoring. Anchoring Epoxy. I'll show it to you. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then the RV water filters all have those as well, so I'll be able to show those to you.